Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Geoffrey Nice, and I'm an Emeritus Professor of Law here at Gresham College. It's my great pleasure to be able to introduce this year's Gray's Inn reading. Now, Gresham College has been providing free public lectures since its founding in the 16th century, designed in the words of our founder, there he is on the wall, Sir Thomas Gresham, to spread the new learning. So for 450 years, education free at the point of contact in this city would be quite wrong to uh, be challenging, wouldn't it? But TED lectures, 450 years, keep going. We doubt you'll make the course. The Gray's Inn reading is a very special annual event, celebrating the association in former days between Gray's Inn, just across the road, and Barnard's Inn. Gresham College has been located in various places since founding, but recently here in this Barnard's Inn Hall, which was established as an inn of chancery linked to Gray's Inn. So again, 500 years ago, there will be students, I'm afraid they would all be men, learning law instructed by their seniors from across the road, just as we are going to be tonight, but in a slightly more modern age. Members of Greys have been appointed as readers to Barnard's Inn, and so the habit or the practice was revived in 2004 with the annual lecture, this lecture, that concludes Gresham's academic year. It's my very great pleasure this evening to welcome this year's Gray's Inn reader, the Right Honourable Lazy Rose of Colmworth, currently a justice of our highest court, the Supreme Court. She was called to the bar by Gray's Inn in 1984, was in practice in Moncton Chambers for 10 years, but didn't feel the need to stick to one thing and showed her skills at others. Leaving private practice to join the government, where she was a legal advisor in financial services at the Treasury, later moving to the Ministry of Defence as Director of Operational and International Humanitarian Law, and then to the Office of Speaker's Counsel in the House of Commons. Her first judicial role as a fee-paid chairman of the Competition Appeal Tribunal was in 2006. 2013, sworn in as a High Court Judge in the Chancery Division, President of the Upper Tribunal in Tax and Chancery Chamber between 2015 and 2018, appointed to the Court of Appeal in January 2019, and then, two years later, to the Supreme Court. Will you welcome, please, Lady Rose. Good evening. It has been said that without a judiciary which can and will administer law fairly and fearlessly between parties, no other guarantee given to the litigants by the law is likely to be of value. Over the centuries, there has certainly been no shortage of descriptions of the qualities one should be looking for in a judge from ancient times to modern. Socrates said, four things belong to a judge, to listen courteously, to answer wisely, to consider soberly, and to decide impartially. In the Bible, in the book of Exodus, Jethro advises Moses to establish a judiciary system to share the load of deciding the legal disputes that were taking up so much of his time. Jethro advises Moses to seek out able men such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness. Moving forward in time, sometimes judges themselves give a perceptive insight into what they think will improve their performance. Sir Matthew Hale, Chief Justice from 1671 to 1676, 
wrote for himself a number of resolutions to which he no doubt tried to stick. These included that I suffer not myself to be prepossessed with any judgment at all till the whole business and both parties be heard, and not to be solicitous what men will say and think so long as I keep myself exactly according to the rule of justice, and also to be short and sparing at meals that I may be fitter for business. In our own time, Lord Newberger of Abbotsbury described the basic qualities needed for a preenie pre judge when running a trial as grip, authority, politeness, fairness, an ability to simplify, and an ability to express yourself. Six principles are contained in the Bangalore Principles of Judicial Conduct, drafted for the International Judicial Group on Strengthening Judicial Integrity in November 2002. Those principles are now reflected in the code that governs my conduct and that of my colleagues as judges in the courts of England and Wales. The Guide to Judicial Conduct published by our Judicial Studies Board introduces in broad terms the six Bangalore principles. They are judicial independence, impartiality, integrity, propriety and the appearance of propriety, equality of treatment to all before the courts, and competence and diligence. All those qualities that we believe make a good judge and more are subsumed in the single criterion for the appointment of judges set out in the Constitutional Reform Act 2005. This provides in section 63 subsection 2 of that act that the selection of judges must be solely on merit. But what does merit mean in this context? Has the content of that word changed since the enactment of the CRA? And more specifically, what can we learn from the overhaul of the processes for appointing judges about who we think makes a good judge? Before the changes brought about by the Constitutional Reform Act, the assumption was that if you were a good and successful barrister, then you would make a good senior judge. It's always been rather mysterious to me as to why that assumption lasted for such a long time. Many of the skills needed for being a top barrister are not at all what you need to be a good judge. A single-minded pursuit of one side of the argument only, an ability to cross-examine witnesses to make them say what you want them to say, an ability to make a thoroughly bad legal submission seem plausible and attractive. All those are talents which, one would hope, the barrister can and must firmly put aside on attaining judicial office. Not only was there that assumption that good barrister equals good judge, but it was so strong that it was thought that a successful barrister would not need any training on making the move to the bench. Lord Judge, former Chief Justice, has remarked in a lecture given to the, Judici to the Judicial Studies Board that when he was appointed to be a recorder of the Crown Court in 1976, he sat for two years before he received any training at all. That was not, he says with characteristic modesty, because of his remarkable talents, but there was not thought to be any need for training. Indeed, he notes that at the time the Judicial Studies Board was set up, there was significant judicial antipathy towards it, with many thinking that training was an interference with judicial independence. The fact that it was called the Judicial Studies Board was a deliberate attempt to reconcile those who thought that they were demeaned by the implication that they might need training in the performance of their responsibilities. By 2013, when Lord Judge was giving his lecture, he said that judges now welcome training and know that it has no bearing whatever on their independence. Being a judge in the modern world, he says, does not merely require such education and training, it requires a frame of mind in which these positive advantages are welcomed. I think the reason why it was assumed that good barristers make good judges was the preeminence given for so long to intellectual ability and intellectual ability of a certain kind to the exclusion of almost every other quality. Judges see that the barristers appearing in front of them are dealing with knotty legal problems or sorting out from a morass of evidence what is and is not relevant day in and day out, and that is also the daily fare of the working judge. 
It is true that you do need to be very clever to do my job. And it's a particular kind of cleverness that is needed. I was thinking of this when reading a biography of the great physicist J. Robert, o J. Robert Oppenheimer. He and the other physicists who unlocked the secrets of the atom in the early 20th century and worked on the Manhattan Project were clearly very clever. But were their brains wired up differently from those of, say, Lord Atkin or Lord Wilberforce? If the young Tom Bingham had decided to become a scientist rather than a lawyer, would he have excelled at that in the same way as, luckily for us, he did in the law? One difference that strikes me is that Oppenheimer, von Neumann and their colleagues thought about, debated, and puzzled out the structure of the atom over many decades. The ability that a good judge needs to have is absorb a mass of information in a day or so. Even in the Supreme Court, with the press of many different demands on our time, we usually have at the most two days in which to learn, usually from scratch, the factual and legal content of a case before the hearing. The topics covered by the work are tremendously varied. In my judicial work in the Supreme Court and the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, I have dealt with many cases in areas that were entirely unknown to me before I clicked on the electronic bundle to prepare for the hearing coming up in a few <coughs> days' time. These include the international legal and institutional framework governing fishing for tuna in the South Pacific, the rights to water flowing in rivers and canals in Mauritius, or closer to home, the operation of the qualified one-way cost-shifting regime in the CPR, as well as many mind-numbingly complicated tax cases about VAT, corporation tax, and the taxation of dividends. So every judge has to be clever enough to be able, within the space really of a few hours, not only to read and understand the material, but to get themselves in a position to decide which of the two competing sets of submissions is right, to be able to challenge those submissions of counsel who may well have been working on the case for years, to discuss the case intelligently with colleagues and then write a judgment or comment on a draft judgment written by someone else. From start to finish, the judge's involvement with the case may last a few weeks or months, at the end of which the judge may have to produce an authoritative and reasoned decision. And that takes a particular kind of intellectual ability. Though I'm not sure whether that answers my question about whether Lord Bingham in some counterfactual world could have invented the atomic bomb, or indeed, whether J. Robert Oppenheimer could have written the judgment in A against the Secretary of State for the Home Department. <coughs> there is, fortunately, an increasing recognition reflected in judicial appointments that barristers in private practice do not by any means have a monopoly on the kind of intellectual ability that is needed to become a judge. And this raises the allied question of how far experience of court-based advocacy or litigation more generally is a prerequisite for being a good judge. I'm often asked when I give talks to the lawyers in the government legal service where I worked for many years of my career, or to solicitors who are not in a dispute resolution team, whether I think that having experience of court work is necessary before applying for judicial appointment. My answer is usually that you might struggle to settle in as a judge if you did not start out with a rough idea of what the relevant procedural rules say, if you had never seen a set of pleadings before or didn't know the basics for an, uh, for an interlocutory injunction. However, maybe I'm being too parochial. Some other jurisdictions operate on a very different basis. For example, in France, a lawyer can qualify as a judge straight out of university, and judges are not ordinarily recruited from the ranks of lawyers. They are specifically trained for the role via a standalone process, and it's common for a person to become a judge before they turn 30. With certain exceptions, most aspiring judges in France are required to train at the École Nationale de la Magistrature in Bordeaux. This is the only judicial training school in the country. Admission to that school is determined by competitive examination. The coursework lasts over 30 months, followed by a cycle of traineeships in the court system and supporting agencies. 
and at the end of this period, a prospective judge takes another exam and is presented with a list of available judicial posts prepared by the Ministry of Justice. Initial appointments are made on the basis of exam scores. Those receiving the highest scores get the pick of positions. And most ENM graduates are appointed to a judgeship in the provinces at the lowest level, working as investigating <coughs> judges or members of benches adjudicating minor criminal cases. They then work their way up the judicial ladder throughout a long career, entirely within the judiciary. By contrast, although the previous focus here on appointing barristers suggests that merit does include experience of court work, the idea of a career judiciary used to be almost unheard of in the United Kingdom courts. People tended to choose the level at which they wanted to join the judicial system, and they expected to stay there for the whole of their judicial career. In more recent years, there has been more movement, for example, of judges appointed in the Crown Court moving to the High Court bench, and judges in the Tribunal Service, where I had my first judicial experience, moving to be district judges or High Court judges. This has benefits for diversity too, as those branches of the judiciary tend to have a better gender and ethnic balance, something I'll discuss more later. Moving on from intellectual ability, there has always been at least one additional requirement for being a good judge. And this is now also encapsulated in Section 63 of the Constitutional Reform Act. Section 63.3 says that a person must not be selected unless the selecting body is satisfied that they are of good character. The Judicial Appointments Commission provides useful guidance to would-be applicants about how it assesses good character. The principles it adopts are based, it says, on the overriding need to maintain public confidence in the standards of the judiciary and the fact that public confidence will only be maintained if judicial office holders maintain the highest standards of behaviour in their professional, public and private lives. It's interesting to see how the content of this requirement reflects the modern zeitgeist. Let me give three examples. The first is that, as you might expect, conviction of a criminal offence is likely to disqualify you from holding office. Judicial appointments are covered by the exceptions order to the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act 1974, so that spent convictions and cautions are not protected from disclosure for these purposes. The JAC takes all criminal convictions and cautions seriously, and you must disclose to the JAC any you have received, regardless of whether they are spent or unspent. However, forgiveness is not entirely alien to the selection process. As a general guide, the JAC may consider you suitable for appointment following a period of six years after you have received a caution, or a period of 11 years following a conviction. The JAC, as one might also expect, makes each decision on a case-by-case -case basis. The attitude towards motoring offences is quite nuanced. In general, the JAC guidance says any conviction for a motoring offence will be treated in the same way as any other criminal conviction, and a conviction for an offence related to driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs is likely to prevent your application from proceeding. Conversely, parking tickets or speeding offences dealt with by way of an informal warning or a speed awareness course do not have to be declared. In between are fixed penalty notices, including for moving vehicle offences. Although they do not form part of your criminal record, they must be declared if received in the last four years. The obligation to disclose is a continuing one, and this is made very clear in the application, and unfortunately became relevant to my own application for appointment to the High Court bench. The only time I've been fined for a moving vehicle offence was a week or so after I had submitted my application to join the Chancery Division. I accidentally drove in a bus lane in my increasingly frantic attempts to escape the St Albans one-way system, trying to find the Crown Court where I was due to sit as a recorder. <laughs> if it had been a criminal offence to be driving a motorised vehicle on a public highway while sobbing, I would have had to have fessed up to that as well. 
Fortunately, the panel was in a forgiving mood, and my trespass did not result in my judicial career meeting a premature end. The second aspect of good character stressed by the JAC is the importance of your tax affairs being in order and of complying in a straightforward and transparent way with your obligations in relation to tax. And this, I would suggest, properly reflects the current sense that good citizens, and hence good judges, should pay their taxes. Sticking with money for the moment, I came across a fascinating, if slightly recherche, article by the late Professor Peter Burks, discussing a recent discovery by metal detectorists in Seville in Spain of 10 bronze inscribed tablets dating back to AD 91, the rule of the Roman Emperor Domitian. One of the many topics covered by the inscriptions were the qualifications for appointment to the judiciary. This discloses that in order to be appointed to be a judge in Rome, a candidate had to have a certain amount of money. And the higher the judicial office, the more money he had to have. It's difficult to see what quality this was supposed to reflect. It does not seem to have been a proxy for the candidate being hardworking and industrious, because it is clear that money could be inherited from the judge's father. If the thought was that judges with a lot of money would be less amenable to be bribed because they already had enough money, that shows, I think, a naivety about human nature, which is uncharacteristic of the Roman society that otherwise emerges from Roman law more generally. The third aspect of good character that I would like to focus on is the changing attitude towards rudeness and bullying by judges. Socrates, as I have mentioned, listed the ability to listen courteously as one of the characteristics of a good judge, but this quality has not invariably been manifest in our courts. This topic has been the subject of a great deal of attention recently. In February 2019, the Bar Council published guidance to barristers about judicial bullying. It defines bullying as offensive, intimidating, malicious or insulting behaviour involving the misuse of power as can make a person feel vulnerable, upset, humiliated, undermined or threatened. The Bar Council recognises that when bullying by judges occurs, it presents additional challenges because those who are a target may feel unable or particularly reluctant to do anything about it even though the impact may be particularly acute. I agree with the article written by a senior barrister in New South Wales and included in the Handbook for Judicial Officers in that Australian jurisdiction. It contains this observation. The idea that judicial bullying is a necessary rite of passage for junior counsel is outdated, dangerous and wholly unacceptable. Older practitioners relating, raw, relating war stories of how they were mistreated by former judges should not be a source of admiration, but rather a sad indictment that this issue has not been addressed earlier. Just because one has suffered the humiliation of judicial bullying and lived to tell the tale does not mean that it should be an experience visited upon newer members of the bar. Rather, it should trigger right-thinking members of the bench and bar to ensure that such behaviour is treated with opprobrium. But why has unpleasant behaviour in court fallen so far out of fashion? It is partly, I think, because younger lawyers have been educated in a school and university system that takes bullying seriously, and they are, quite rightly, no longer prepared to put up with it. But to my mind, this whole issue is much more significant than just being a way of protecting barristers from having a bad day at the office, important though that is. If lay clients sitting in court see the judge being rude and impatient with their counsel or with the witnesses on their side, they will feel strongly that they have not had a fair hearing. Their dissatisfaction will not only be with the judge, but also, however unfairly, with their counsel and with the overall process of adjudication. And this becomes a vicious circle because an advocate will rarely give of his or her best for the client or the cause or for the court when subjected to undue pressure. The importance of what is said as well as what is done by the judge in court is also reflected by an interesting statistic 
about the categories of complaint about judicial conduct made to the Judicial Conduct Investigations Office. The JCIO's annual report for 2020 to 2021 states that 232 complaints, about 19% of the total, were about inappropriate behavior by the judge. The report states that most of these complaints are found to be unsubstantiated or, even if true, insufficiently serious to require disciplinary action to be taken. But the fact that 232 people took the trouble to lodge a complaint with the JCIO about behaviour in court is a salutary reminder to any serving or would-be judge that people are listening and watching and holding us to a high standard as regards our behaviour. At the other end of the spectrum, does a judge need to have a sense of humour? That New South Wales Judicial Conduct Handbook contains a delightful article by the Honourable Judge Kairou of the Court of Appeal, Supreme Court of Victoria. He discusses some of the key personal attributes of a good judge, in which he includes not only independence, impartiality and communication skills, but also patience, cultural awareness and tolerance, people skills, a sense of perspective and a sense of humour. He says, the administration of justice is a serious business with important obligations and responsibilities. Court cases involve tremendous stress for court users and therefore the courtroom is not the place for judges to try their hand at being comedians. But that does not mean, however, that judges must be perennially uptight and unhappy. A balanced lifestyle, interests outside the law, a down-to-earth personality and a good sense of humour can increase a judge's enjoyment of the judicial role and this can assist in ensuring that the mood in the courtroom is positive, which in turn can ensure that the hearing is conducted in an efficient and harmonious manner. One can contr contrast this approach with a comment of Lord Judge in that 2013 lecture I referred to earlier. He also lists the qualities that he considers the modern judge must have. These include the ability to make decisions that are profoundly unpleasant and have very serious consequences. This is not a fun job, he said, and you have to do it. I would say that that is true, of course, but the job is sometimes a fun job. And if you're going to get through the difficult and tense times, it can be helpful to be able to lighten the mood when that is appropriate. That said, judges have sometimes got into trouble for flippancy or inappropriate remarks. And every judge must also bear in mind that you do not get a genuine reaction for those in court. So the fact that everyone in court roars with laughter at some little quip that you make at the end of the day should not encourage you to give up the day job and start working the circuit as a stand-up comedian. Your audience might well be rolling their eyes as soon as you have left court. No talk, or at least no talk by me, about what makes a good judge is complete without some mention of diversity. And this is also dealt with in Section 63 of the Constitutional Reform Act. Following on from the provision that appointment must be solely on merit, subsection 4 qualifies this by providing, but the use of the word solely there does not prevent the selecting body where two persons are of equal merit from, from preferring one of them over the other for the purpose of increasing diversity within the group of persons who hold office for which there is a selection under that act. Critics of this provision have commented that this appears to embrace the view that diversity is something different from merit and as if there has to be a choice made between the two ideas or a balance of them treating them as competing goals. Another way to look at it is to recognise that for many centuries, the selection of judges has not truly been on merit, or rather it has been limited to comparing the merits of only a very narrow group of people. This does not seem to have troubled those who have been selected under that system and who are sometimes heard to complain about the unfairness of this tiebreaker provision. By contrast, it might be said that by the time a woman or a person from an ethnic minority community gets to the position where subsection 4 might be triggered, they must already have overcome such challenges of conscious and unconscious bias that they may well, in fact, be of greater merit than their rival. 
Further, treating the ability of a candidate to bring a fresh perspective from a different life experience as being something not embraced by the term merit seems to me unfortunate. This was put very well by Sir Sidney Kentridge when he gave the second Sir David Williams lecture at Cambridge University in May 2002. The topic of his lecture was the highest court selecting the judges. It was prompted by the coming into force of the Human Rights Act 1998. This act, Sir Sidney said, permits and requires hitherto unknown judicial interventions, not only into the sphere of executive action, but also into the sphere of legislation. Did this, he asked, mean that we should look for different qualities in our top judges? Sensitivity to social issues and an appreciation of the importance of individual rights would be desirable qualities if only, he says, there were some way of discerning them. So Sidney compared the, at that time, entirely white male middle-class members of the House of Lords with the South African Constitutional Court on which Sir Sidney sat as an acting justice. Of the 11 judges on that Constitutional Court, there were six white men, three black men, one black woman, and one white woman. Five had been High Court judges, some had come directly from the bar, and at least four had at some point been academics as well as having worked in private practice, either as advocates or attorneys. One had been a political exile. So Sidney writes, they were all good lawyers, but what I found overwhelming was the depth and variety of their experience of law and life. This diversity, he said, illuminated their discussions when he was sitting, especially when competing interests, individual, governmental, and social, had to be weighed. I have no doubt, he said, that this diversity gave the court as a whole a maturity of judgment he would not otherwise have had. This brings me to another quality required of judges. The framework of judicial abilities and qualities published by the Judicial Studies Board lists compassion as one of the qualities included under the umbrella of community and authority, along with firmness without arrogance and sensitivity. This quality is discussed by Robert J. Sharp, a judge of the Court of Appeal of Ontario, in his book Good Judgment, Making Judicial Decisions. He notes that our most respected judges are often described as compassionate. But what exactly does it mean to judge with compassion? The law is the law and must be applied with an even and consistent hand and cannot be modified on grounds of sympathy or emotion. Indeed, I would add in parenthesis, another of the qualities in the Judicial Studies Board's framework is remains detached and manages one's reactions and emotions. Judge Sharp's answer is that judging is not an abstract or mechanical process. It is an intensely human process. The judge is engaged in unraveling and resolving disputes that often have had a profound effect on the lives of the litigant. A judge who is able to see all sides of a problem has a better chance of making a decision that is both fair and just and seen to be fair and just. He quotes Canadian Chief Justice Brian Dixon as saying that a judge must be guided by an ever-present awareness and concern for the plight of others and the human condition. Compassion is not some extra legal factor magnanimously acknowledged by a benevolent legal decision maker. Rather, compassion is part and parcel of the nature and content of what we call law. That is certainly something that accords with my own experience and is true whatever area of the law you specialize in as a judge. One thing that struck me during my time as a judge in the Chancery Division is how often what appears on the face of it to be a rather dry case exploring some arcane provision of the Companies Act or the Insolvency Act in fact arises from a very human dispute between the litigants. The parties use the courts to resolve their own feelings of upset or betrayal about some business partnership that went wrong or some ambitious commercial venture that unhappily foundered, throwing their lives into turmoil. So as a trial judge, being able to feel compassion or being able to empathize with the parties and the predicament they find themselves in 
is often an essential part of being able to decide which of the parties is giving the more accurate account of what happened when you come to make the findings of fact, as well as the other elements that go into forming the bedrock of your application of the law. Following on from that thought, let me close by sharing some advice I give to judges just starting out, and which indeed I regularly give to myself, and which I find very helpful in my desire to be a good judge. Bear this in mind. For every case that you preside over, there comes a point a day or so before the hearing when the lawyers involved in the case find out from the listing office that you are going to be the judge hearing their case. They ring up the client and say, we've just heard that we have Mrs Justice Rose or Mr Justice X. Inevitably, the client asks, is that good or bad? What is he or she like? So if you want to be a good judge, try to think of how you would like the lawyer to respond to that question from the client. And then, in all the different aspects of your conduct in and out of court, try to behave so as to bring that about. Thank you. Lady Rose, thank you very much for a fascinating lecture. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions now, if, if you don't mind. Um, are there any questions in the hall? We've got a few hands up. If you could just hang on for one second, my colleague is just going to bring in the microphone, OK? Hello, thank you so much for the talk. Fascinating. And I wonder, does a good judge ever have doubts about their decision? And how do you deal with that? as a judge thinking about a case decision after you've made it? Do you put it aside? What do you do? I don't, I don't particularly recall a time. I certainly recall a time when I have changed my mind during the course of the hearing, when I've went, gone into a hearing having pre-read the papers and thought I was likely to come to one view and then have entirely turned around during the course of the, of the hearing. But then I'm usually pretty firmly of the view that I come to. Sometimes you do that, and then when you hear the other advocate, you realize you were right the first time. Um, I don't think that there's much scope for anxiety after the decision, because you move on so quickly to the next case. Of course, what sometimes happens is your decision goes up to the higher court and then you're either upheld, in which case you say, phew, I did take the right decision, or you're overturned, at which point you can either say, well, I was right all along and they've completely messed up, or you can say, well, I can see um, that the case was argued in a slightly different way. Um, there are... The thing about the, the job is that you do have to arrive at a decision at the end of the day, and someone has to win and someone has to lose. Um, but I think for me, I feel as long as I have uh, overseen a fair process and I have explained my reasons clearly in the judgment, that satisfies me and I would hope would satisfy both the parties, both the winner and the loser at the end of the day. May I pose a question from the online mm. audience? They've been coming in thick and fast now. Um, sorry, I've lost it. My son is currently sitting his A-levels and wants to pursue a career in law and eventually become a judge. What is the best advice you would give him at the age of 18? <laughs> I would certainly recommend a career in the law. I've thoroughly enjoyed all the different aspects of my career. And I think that legal training as a mental discipline is a very good training, whether you choose to spend your career as a lawyer in one or more different branches of the professions or whether you choose to go on to do something else. Um, I think that if you are minded to me be making your way towards the judiciary, the important thing is that wherever you um, practice as a lawyer, you must keep primarily a legal content to your work. One of the reasons why I left the civil service when I did was that I saw that if I was promoted to a higher grade, I would lose a lot of the legal content of my job and 
um, do more management and strategy. And although a lot of lawyers really take to that and really enjoy that, I very much wanted to maintain primarily a legal content. And if you are thinking of being a, a judge, then I think that that is, does still have to be an important part of your um, career. And it's also, I mean, I, one of the things that certainly helped me, having come from a rather unconventional background for the judiciary, was that I had specialised in practice in an area of law about which there was a tribunal. So I had been a competition lawyer in Gray's Inn, and then I, my first judicial post was in the competition appeal tribunal. And I think that was helpful because many fee-paid judges get their first post um, dealing with law with which they're familiar. And once they've got some experience and judge craft skills, then they can move to um, uh, be a judge in other areas of the law as well. So I think those would be the two things. Okay, thank you. I think there were some other questions in the hall. If you could wait, sir, just for the mic to come to you. <clears throat> the, the recently leaked judgment of the US Supreme Court on abortion rights shows that the court is sharply polarized on purely political lines which have nothing to do with constitutional principles. Would you agree that this is the inevitable and very unfortunate result of the fatally flawed judicial appointment system which is in force in that country? <laughs> I think that one of the things that one learns as a, a judge is that uh, and as a lawyer, that, that procedural matters um, are very individual for different countries. And every country will make murder a criminal offence. Um, but when it comes to the organisation of the courts and the method for selecting judges, there are a whole range of different models which are, are used. Um, the French example is, is one I gave. Um, here, we don't have political involvement in the appointment of judges. Um, whether there is inevitably polarisation if you do have a political component, I don't know. I mean, I would say that even in the US, the number of cases in which politics, either with a big P or a small P, is actually relevant is tiny. Those are the ones, of course, that get the, the, the media coverage. But most of the cases that most of us are doing most of the time are nothing to do with those kinds of controversial areas. I think was there at the back? No? Uh, okay, one, one just there. Yes, good evening. Thank you very much. Um, could you please tell me, you have only touched very lightly on the impartiality of judges as one of the characteristics. Um, as a hospital doctor and a lawyer, I would like to know, there has been a lot of recent research in subconscious bias, especially in courts around the globe. Do judges get any training in Britain in subconscious bias? And, and how do they go about it? There's a lot of research going on at the moment showing that we are not aware of our subconscious bias. The answer to that is certainly yes, that at various stages of my judicial career, I have had training in uh, subconscious bias. And certainly all those who are involved in the selection of judges do undergo that training. Um, and so that, that is part of the importance of being open to, to training and not regarding it as, as something, as an anathema to one's independence. Yes, there, there is that kind of training. There is also a marvellous publication called The Bench Book, which I think is online, which is, which is um, a resource for judges covering all sorts of different um, issues about what language it's appropriate to use, about how one should make accommodations for people with various disabilities. Um, and we are often being notified of, of updates for that. So for example, a year or so ago, there was an issue about um, arrangements that you should make for somebody who's in court who has Asperger's syndrome. And 
little adjustments that you can make which might not occur to you as a judge if someone hadn't pointed it out. So yes, there, there is that resource, which I, I've quite often called on, um, available to judges, and there is certainly um, uh, training about that kind of thing. I have a question about, um, there's a couple of questions about diversity. One is about women. Women are still in the minority in the senior levels of the judiciary, and the process of climbing the ladder can be daunting. Do you have any advice for aspiring women judges? Just keep applying for positions. It will only get easier if more people, more women do it. And I think you must never be put off by um, the imbalance that there, there is in the um, bench to which you want to, um, which you want to join. Um, and every time you achieve something, you make it that bit easier for the people who come after. Okay, there's another one here, um, a very concise question. Do, do good judges try their best to keep their judgments concise? <laughs> <laughs> um, this, is, this length of judgments is, um, is a, certainly a point that people complain about. Um, and it's a factor of a number of things. The word processor, of course, makes everything a bit longer the availability online of so many thousands of authorities mean that many more authorities are cited to the courts and judge, judges feel that they need to, to deal with them. Arguments are very sophisticated and even though the Court of Appeal keeps telling High Court judges and judges in other um, benches don't feel you have to deal with every point, there is a feeling that in order to give people a sense that they've had a, a good, a fair hearing, even if they've lost, and of course that's most important for the side that lose, they do have to see a substantial written judgment. And I think that if you've presided over a trial, as I sometimes did for 30, 32 days, people expect quite a tome at the end of that. And that you also need to realise that the judgment is directed at a number of different audiences. And the parties are not interested in all the legal part. They're interested in the bit that the law students and the academics and the Court of Appeal sometimes just scroll down through, which is the findings of fact, because they want to know were they believed or not. And to give them that sense of having had a proper hearing and, a, and, and a, uh, enable them to move on after the, uh, the closure of the proceedings, they have to see that the judge has really understood what was going on, has really assessed the evidence. Um, and I think that, that takes up time and it takes up space nowadays. So, um, of course, one tries to be concise, but I think that um, the days when judges would just extempore give a four-page judgment after a substantial trial, I'm afraid, are gone and they're not coming back. Thank you. Are there any other questions in the hall? There's one over here, and then we will probably finish at that point. I just wanted to ask about when you have a hearing and arguments are being made rather than evidence being given. How active or passive should a good judge be during that hearing? Right. Um, I think that advocates and the parties often misinterpret interventions from the bench. I think you can't overstate the extent to which the judge, from the moment they arrive in court, is thinking about the judgment that they're going to have to write. Um, and most of the questions are directed at the judge making sure that they have tested the arguments so that they know, whether they're going to agree with them or not, how they're going to deal with them in the judgment. And also, 
trying, the, the thing that's most difficult about judgments is getting the structure right. And that is something where submissions from counsel are not always very helpful. Um, submissions from counsel can have a section of you know, the meeting of the 6th of June. They say this happened, we say that happened, you should decide in favor of our witnesses. But the judge just can't have a judgment that says the meeting of the 6th of June, I believe him. It's, it's got to be brought into some kind of structure. So I think a lot of judicial intervention is testing the arguments, trying to work out what is the scheme that I'm going ultimately to have to follow in the judgment. Um, I, I really enjoy the to and fro between counsel and the bench. Sometimes counsel say they find it quite unnerving if the judge actually sits there completely silently throughout the hearing because they have absolutely no idea where, they're, where it's going. So I think the, the good advocates are able to respond in a helpful way. Um, whether sometimes judges press a little bit too hard, I don't know. I think people are mostly fairly tough, but that was one of the things that I mentioned about in the talk. Um, but I think that don't, I'd say to barristers, don't try and read too much in to the nature of the questions or the extent of the questioning. Um, it's really just the judge trying to work out not only what the answer is, but how they're going to express that. Well, Lady Rose, I'd like to thank you on behalf of Gresham College for your presentation of this year's Gray's Inn reading. It was really fascinating to hear your views on the characteristics that make a good judge. We'd like to thank you for your generosity in, in devoting your time this evening and to the lecture and to answering the audience questions. Um, the whole presentation is a welcome addition to the Gray's Inn series, which you can all check out online. Um, it's on our website. We'd also like, of course, to thank uh, the Honourable Society of Grey's Inn for your co-sponsorship of this event. Um, and finally, thanks to our audience, uh, those both, both those attending in person and those of you who have joined us online. Thank you for your attention this evening. This is the final lecture in Gresham College's academic program for this year. So please do keep an eye out for um, our next program. That will be issued online in August. We have lots of exciting new lectures coming out, um, and we look forward to welcoming you back. So please do join me in thanking our speaker again, Lady Rose.